introductory materials of oscar wilde a study this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by david wales oscar wilde a study by andre gide and translated by stuart mason introductory materials dedication to donald bruce wallace of new york in memory of a visit last summer to bagneux cemetery a pilgrimage of love when we watered with our tears the roses and lilies with which we covered the poet's grave oxford september nineteen o five a poem by wilde the little poem on the opposite page first saw the light in the pages of the dublin university magazine for september eighteen seventy six it has not been reprinted since the greek quotation is taken from the agamemnon of aeschylus one one twenty aelenon aunon aipi to dieu nicato o oh, well for him who lives at ease with garnered gold in wide domain nor heeds the plashing of the rain the crashing down of forest trees o oh, well for him who ne'er hath known the travail of the hungry years a father gray with grief and tears a mother weeping all alone but well for him whose feet hath trod the weary road of toil and strife yet from the sorrows of his life builds ladders to be nearer god oscar f o f wills wilde s m magdalen college oxford translator's note m gide's study of mr oscar wilde perhaps the best account yet written of the poet's latter days appeared first in le metage a monthly literary review in june nineteen o two it was afterwards reprinted with some few slight alterations in a volume of critical essays entitled pretextes by m gide it is now published in english for the first time by special arrangement with the author s m oscar wilde introductory oscar fingal o'flaherty wills wilde was born at one marion square north dublin on october sixteenth eighteen fifty four he was the second son of sir william robert wilde knight a celebrated surgeon who was president of the irish academy and chairman of the census committee sir william wilde was born in seventeen ninety nine and died at the age of seventy seven years oscar wilde's mother was jane francesca daughter of archdeacon l g she was born in eighteen twenty six and married in eighteen fifty one she became famous in literary circles under the pen names of speranza and john fenshaw ellis among her published writings being driftwood from scandinavia eighteen eighty four legends of ireland eighteen eighty six and social studies eighteen ninety three lady wilde died at her residence in chelsea on february third eighteen ninety six oscar wilde received his early education at portora royal school enniskellen which he entered in eighteen sixty four at the age of nine years here he remained for seven years and winning a royal scholarship he entered trinity college dublin on october nineteenth eighteen seventy one being then seventeen years of age in the following year he obtained first-class honors in classics in hillary trinity and michaelmas terms he also won the gold medal for greek and other distinctions the trinity college magazine Codabus, for the year eighteen seventy six nine contains some of his earliest published poems in eighteen seventy four he obtained a classical scholarship and went up to oxford where as a demi he matriculated at magdalen college on october seventeenth the day after his twentieth birthday his career at oxford was one unbroken success in trinity term june eighteen seventy six he obtained a first class in the honor school of classical moderations in literis gracis et latinis which he followed up two years later by a similar distinction in greats or honor finals in literis humanoribus in this same trinity term eighteen seventy eight 
he further distinguished himself by gaining the sir roger newdigate prize for english verse with his poem ravenna which he recited at the encine or annual commemoration of benefactors in the sheldonian theatre on june twenty sixth he proceeded to the degree of b a in the following term he is described in foster's alumni oxyensis as a professor of aesthetics and art critic he afterwards lectured on art in america eighteen eighty two and in the provinces on his return to england about this time he wrote his poems the sphinx and the harlot's house eighteen eighty three and his tragedy in blank verse the duchess of padua the latter was written specially for miss mary anderson but she did not produce it this was however played in america by the late lawrence barrett in eighteen eighty three as was also another play in blank verse entitled bira or the nihilist during the previous year he had already published in america and england a volume of poems which went through several editions in a few months in eighteen eighty four oscar wilde married miss constance mary lloyd a daughter of the well-known q c by whom he had two sons born in june eighteen eighty five and november eighteen eighty six respectively mrs wilde died in eighteen ninety eight and his only brother william in march of the following year during the next five or six years after his marriage articles from his pen appeared in several of the leading reviews notably the portrait of mr w h in blackwood's edinburgh magazine for july eighteen eighty nine and those brilliant essays afterwards incorporated in intentions in the nineteenth century and the fortnightly review in eighteen eighty eight he was the editor of a monthly journal called the woman's world in july eighteen ninety the picture of dorian gray appeared in lippincott's monthly magazine it was the only novel he ever wrote and was published in book form with seven additional chapters in the following year and is one of the most remarkable books in the english language with the production and immediate success of lady windermere's fan early in eighteen ninety two he was at once recognized as a dramatist of the first rank this was followed a year later by a woman of no importance and after brief intervals by an ideal husband and the importance of being earnest the two latter were being played in london at the time of the author's arrest and trial into the melancholy story of his trial it is not proposed to enter here beyond mentioning the fact that he was condemned by the newspapers and consequently by the vast majority of the british public several weeks before a jury could be found to return a verdict of guilty on saturday may twenty fifth eighteen ninety five he was sentenced to two years imprisonment with hard labor most of which period was passed at wandsworth and reading on his release from reading on wednesday may nineteenth eighteen ninety seven he at once crossed to france with friends and a few days later penned that pathetic letter pregnant with pity in which he pleaded for the kindlier treatment of little children lying in our english jails this letter with his own name attached filled over two columns in the daily chronicle of may twenty eighth it created considerable sensation a well-known catholic weekly comparing it in its crushing power to the letter with which stevenson shamed the shameless traducer of father damien a second letter on the subject of the cruelties of the english prison system appeared in the same paper on march twenty fourth eighteen ninety eight it was headed don't read this if you want to be happy to-day and was signed the author of the ballad of reading jail the ballad of reading jail was published early in this same year under the nom de plume c three three oscar wilde's prison number its authorship was acknowledged shortly afterwards in an autograph edition since that time countless editions of this famous work have been issued in england and america and translations have appeared in french german and spanish of this poem a reviewer in a london journal said the whole is awful as the pages of sophocles 
that he has rendered with his fine art so much of the essence of his life and the life of others in that inferno to the sensitive is a memorable thing for the social scientist but a much more memorable thing for literature this is a simple a poignant a great ballad one of the greatest in the english language of the sorrows and sufferings of the last few years of his life his friend mr robert harborough sherard has written in the story of an unhappy friendship and m gide refers to them in the following pages after several weeks of intense suffering death the silent pilot came at last and the most brilliant writer of the nineteenth century passed away on the afternoon of november thirtieth nineteen hundred in poverty and almost alone the little hotel in paris hotel de l'alsace thirteen rue des beaux-arts where he died has become a place of pilgrimage from all parts of the world for those who admire his genius or pity his sorrows he was buried three days later in the cemetery at bagneux about four miles out of paris stuart mason tombstone inscription oscar wilde october sixteenth eighteen fifty four november thirtieth nineteen hundred verbis meis adera nihil adabant et super illos stillabat eloquium meum job twenty nine twenty two r i p end of introductory materials chapter one of oscar wilde a study by andre gide and translated by stuart mason this librivox recording is in the public domain i was at biskra in december nineteen hundred when i learned through the newspapers of the lamentable end of oscar wilde distance alas prevented me from joining in the meagre procession which followed his body to the cemetery at bagneux it was of no use reproaching myself that my absence would seem to diminish still further the small number of friends who remained faithful to him at least i wanted to write these few pages at once but for a considerable period wilde's name seemed to become once more the property of the newspapers now that every idle rumour connected with his name so sadly famous is hushed now that the mob is at last wearied after having praised wondered at and then reviled him perhaps a friend may be allowed to lay like a wreath on a forsaken grave these lines of affection admiration and respectful pity when the trial with all its scandal which so excited the public mind in england threatened to wreck his life certain writers and artists attempted to carry out in the name of literature and art a kind of rescue it was hoped that by praising the writer the man would be excused unfortunately there was a misunderstanding here for it must be acknowledged that wilde was not a great writer the leaden buoy which was thrown to him helped only to weigh him down his works far from keeping him up seemed to sink with him in vain were some good hands stretched out the torrent of the world overwhelmed him all was over it was not possible at that time to think of defending him in any other way instead of trying to shelter the man behind his work it was necessary to show forth first the man as an object of admiration as i am going to try to do now and then the work itself illuminated by his personality i have put all my genius into my life i have put only my talent into my works said wilde once great writer no but great viveur yes if one may use the word in the fullest sense of the french term like certain greek philosophers of old wilde did not write his wisdom but spoke and lived it entrusting it rashly to the fleeting memory of man thereby writing it as it were on water let those who knew him for a longer time than i did tell the story of his life one of those who listened to him most eagerly relates here simply a few personal recollections one 
and the mighty nations would have crowned me who am crownless now and without name and some orient dawn had found me kneeling on the threshold of the house of fame those who became acquainted with wilde only in the latter years of his life form a wrong conception of the wonderful creature he formerly was if they judge from the enfeebled and crushed being given back to us from prison as ernest lejeunesse paints him for instance in the best or rather the only passable article on the great reprobate which any one has had the talent or the courage to write it was in eighteen ninety one that i met him for the first time wilde had then what thackeray calls one of the greatest of a great man's qualities success his manner and his appearance were triumphant his success was so assured that it seemed to go in front of him and he only had to advance his books were causing wonder and delight all london was soon to rush to see his plays he was rich he was great he was handsome he was loaded with happiness and honours some compared him to an asiatic bacchus others to some roman emperor and others again to apollo himself in short he was resplendent in paris his name passed from mouth to mouth as soon as he arrived several absurd sayings went around concerning him as that after all he was only the man who smoked gold-tipped cigarettes and walked about the streets with a sunflower in his hand for skilful in misleading those who are the heralds of earthly fame wilde knew how to hide his real personality behind an amusing phantom with which he humorously deluded the public i had heard him talked about at stephane Mallarmé's house where he was described as a brilliant conversationalist and i expressed a wish to know him little hoping that i should ever do so a happy chance or rather a friend gave me the opportunity and to him i made known my desire wilde was invited to dinner it was at a restaurant we were a party of four but three of us were content to listen wilde did not converse he told tales during the whole meal he hardly stopped he spoke in a slow musical tone and his very voice was wonderful he knew french almost perfectly but pretended now and then to hesitate a little for a word to which he wanted to call our attention he had scarcely any accent at least only what it pleased him to affect when it might give a somewhat new or strange appearance to a word for instance he used purposely to pronounce cesticisma as scepticisma the stories he told us without a break that evening were not of his best uncertain of his audience he was testing us for in his wisdom or perhaps in his folly he never betrayed himself into saying anything which he thought would not be to the taste of his hearers so he doled out food to each according to his appetite those who expected nothing from him got nothing or only a little light froth and as at first he used to give himself up to the task of amusing many of those who thought they knew him will have known him only as the amuser when dinner was over we went out my two friends walking together wilde took me aside and said quite suddenly you hear with your eyes that is why i am going to tell you this story he began when narcissus died the flowers of the fields were plunged in grief and asked the river for drops of water that they might mourn for him oh replied the river if all my drops of water were tears i should not have enough to weep for narcissus myself i loved him how could you help loving narcissus rejoined the flowers so beautiful was he was he beautiful asked the river and who should know that better than yourself said the flowers for every day lying on your bank he would mirror his own beauty in your waters wilde stopped for a moment and then went on if i loved him replied the river it is because when he hung over my waters i saw the reflection of my waters in his eyes then wilde drawing himself up added with a strange outburst of laughter that is called the disciple we had reached his door and left him he asked me to meet him again during the course of that year and the next i saw him frequently and everywhere 
in the presence of others as i have mentioned wilde would put on an air of showing off in order to astonish or amuse or even exasperate people he never listened to and scarcely took any notice of an idea from the moment it was no longer purely his own when he was no longer the only one to shine he would shut himself up and emerge again only when one found oneself alone with him once more but as soon as we were alone again he would begin well what have you been doing since yesterday now as at that time my life was passing uneventfully enough the telling of what i had been doing was of no interest so to humour him i began recounting some trifling incidents and noticed while i was speaking that wilde's face was growing gloomy you really did that he said yes i answered and you are speaking the truth absolutely then why repeat it you must see that it is not of the slightest importance you must understand that there are two worlds the one exists and is never talked about it is called the real world because there is no need to talk about it in order to see it the other is the world of art one must talk about that because otherwise it would not exist then he went on once upon a time there was a man who was beloved in his village because he used to tell tales every morning he left the village and when he returned in the evening all the laborers of the village who had been working all the day would crowd around him and say come now tell us a tale what have you seen to-day the man said i've seen in the forest a fawn playing on a flute and making a band of little wood nymphs dance go on with your story what did you see the men would say when i reached the seashore i saw three mermaids beside the waves combing their green hair with golden combs and the villagers loved him because he used to tell them tales one morning he left his village as usual and when he reached the seashore he saw three mermaids at the water's edge combing their green hair with golden combs and as he passed on his way he saw near a wood a fawn playing a flute to a band of wood nymphs that evening when he returned to his village the people said to him as they did every evening come tell us a tale what have you seen and the man answered i have seen nothing wilde stopped for a moment to allow the effect of the story to sink into me and then he continued i do not like your lips they are quite straight like the lips of a man who has never told a lie i want you to learn to lie so that your lips may become beautiful and curved like the lips of an antique mask do you know what makes the work of art and what makes the work of nature do you know what the difference is for the narcissus is as beautiful as a work of art so what distinguishes them cannot be merely beautiful do you know what it is that distinguishes them a work of art is always unique nature who makes nothing durable is ever repeating herself so that nothing she makes may be lost a single narcissus produces many blooms that is why each one lives but a day every time nature invents a new form she at once makes a replica a sea monster in one sea knows that in another sea there is another monster like itself when god creates in history a nero a borgia or a napoleon he puts another one on one side no one knows it but that does not matter the important point is that one may be a success for god makes man and man makes the work of art forestalling what i was on the point of saying he proceeded yes i know one day a great restlessness fell upon the earth as if at last nature was going to create something unique something quite unique and christ is born on earth yes i know quite well but listen when joseph of arimathea came down in the evening from mount calvary where jesus had just died he saw on a white stone a young man seated weeping and joseph went near to him and said i understand how great thy grief must be for certainly that man was a just man but the young man made answer oh it is not for that that i am weeping 
i am weeping because i too have wrought miracles i also have given sight to the blind i have healed the palsied and i've raised the dead i too have caused the barren fig tree to wither away and i have turned water into wine and yet they have not crucified me and that oscar wilde was convinced of his representative mission was made quite clear to me on more than one occasion the gospel disturbed and troubled the pagan wilde he could not forgive it its miracles the pagan miracle lies in the work of art christianity encroached on it every strong departure from realism in art demands a realism which is convinced in life his most ingenious fables his most alarming ironies were uttered with a view to confront the two moralities i mean pagan naturalism and christian idealism and to put the latter out of countenance in every respect this is another of his stories when jesus was minded to return to nazareth nazareth was so changed that he no longer recognized his own city the nazareth where he had lived was full of lamentations and tears this city was filled with outbursts of laughter and song and christ entering into the city saw some slaves laden with flowers hastening towards the marble staircase of a house of white marble christ entered into the house and at the back of a hall of jasper he saw lying on a purple couch a man whose disordered locks were mingled with red roses and whose lips were red with wine christ drew near to him and laying his hand on his shoulder said to him why dost thou lead this life the man turned round recognized him and said i was a leper once thou didst heal me why should i live another life christ went out of the house and behold in the street he saw a woman whose face and raiment were painted and whose feet were shod with pearls and behind her walked a man who wore a cloak of two colours and whose eyes were bright with lust and christ went up to the man and laid his hand on his shoulder and said to him tell me why art thou following this woman and why dost thou look at her in such wise the man turning round recognized him and said i was blind thou didst heal me what else should i do with my sight and christ drew near to the woman and said to her this road which thou art following is the pathway of sin why follow it the woman recognized him and laughing said the way which i follow is a pleasant way and thou hast pardoned all my sins then christ felt his heart filled with sadness and he was minded to leave the city but as he was going out of it he saw sitting by the bank of the moat of the city a young man who was weeping he drew near to him and touching the locks of his hair said to him friend why dost thou weep the young man raised his eyes recognized him and made answer i was dead and thou hast raised me to life what else should i do with my life let me tell this one story more illustrating one of the strangest pitfalls into which the imagination can mislead a man and let any one who is able understand the strange paradox which wilde here makes use of then there was a great silence in the judgment hall of god and the soul of the sinner stood naked before god and god opened the book of the life of the sinner and said surely thy life hath been very evil thou hast there followed a wonderful a marvellous list of sins since thou hast done all this surely i will send thee to hell and the man cried out thou canst not send me to hell and god said to the man wherefore can i not send thee to hell and the man made answer and said because in hell i have always lived and there was a great silence in the judgment hall of god and god spake and said to the man seeing that i may not send thee to hell i am going to send thee to heaven thou canst not send me to heaven and god said to the man wherefore can i not send thee to heaven and the man said because i have never been able to imagine it and there was a great silence in the judgment hall of god 
one morning wilde handed me an article in which a sufficiently dense critic congratulated him on knowing how to write pretty stories in which the better to clothe his thoughts they think began wilde that all thoughts come naked to the birth they do not understand that i cannot think otherwise than in stories the sculptor does not try to reproduce his thoughts in marble he thinks in marble straight away now listen there was once a man who could think only in bronze and this man one day had an idea an idea of the pleasure that abideth for a moment and he felt that he must give expression to it but in the whole world there was but one single piece of bronze for men had used it all up and this man felt that he would go mad if he did not give expression to his idea and he remembered a piece of bronze on the tomb of his wife a statue which he had himself fashioned to set on the tomb of his wife the only woman he had ever loved it was the image of the sorrow that endureth forever and the man felt that he was becoming mad because he could not give expression to his idea then he took this image of sorrow of the sorrow that endureth forever and broke it up and melted it and fashioned of it an image of pleasure of the pleasure that abideth for a moment wilde was a believer in a certain fatality besetting the path of the artist and that the man is at the mercy of the idea there are he used to say artists of two kinds some supply answers and others ask questions it is necessary to know if one belongs to those who answer or to those who ask questions for the one who asks questions is never the one who answers them there are certain works which wait for their interpretation for a long time it is because they are giving answers to questions that have not yet been asked for the question often comes a terribly long time after the answer and he added further the soul is born old in the body it is to rejuvenate the soul that the body becomes old plato is socrates young again then it was three years before i saw him again end of chapter one chapter two of oscar wilde a study by andre gide and translated by stuart mason this librivox recording is in the public domain i have made my choice have lived my poems and though youth is gone in wasted days i have found the lover's crown of myrtle better than the poet's crown of bays here tragic reminiscences begin a persistent rumor growing louder and louder with the fame of his successes in london his plays were being acted in no less than three different theatres at the same time attributed to wilde strange habits on hearing of which some people tempered their indignation with a smile while others were not in the least indignant it was claimed moreover as regards these alleged habits that he concealed them little and often on the other hand paraded them some said courageously others out of cynicism and others for a pose i was filled with astonishment when i heard these rumours in no way all the time that i had been intimate with him had he given me the slightest ground for suspicion but already out of prudence numbers of his old friends were deserting him they had not yet actually cut him but they no longer made a point of saying that they had met him an extraordinary coincidence brought us together again it was in january eighteen ninety five i was travelling a peevish disposition urged me on and i sought solitude rather than novelty of scene the weather was frightful i had fled from algiers to blida and i was about to quit blida for biskra just as i was leaving my hotel i glanced through idle curiosity at the slate on which visitors names were inscribed what did i see there by the side of my own name actually touching it was wilde's i have said that i was thirsting to be alone so i took the sponge and rubbed my name out 
before reaching the railway station however i was not quite sure that a little cowardice did not underlie that act so at once retracing my steps i had my bag taken upstairs and wrote my name on the slate again in the three years since i had seen him for i can hardly count a short meeting in florence the year before wilde had certainly changed one felt that there was less tenderness in his look that there was something harsh in his laughter and a, a madness in his joy he seemed at the same time to be more sure of pleasing and less ambitious to succeed therein he had grown reckless hardened and conceited strangely enough he no longer spoke in fables and during several days that i tarried there i was not once able to draw the shortest tale from him my first impression was one of astonishment at finding him in algeria oh he said to me just now i am fleeing from art i want only to adore the sun have you ever noticed how the sun detests thought the sun always causes thought to withdraw itself and take refuge in the shade thought dwelt in egypt originally but the sun conquered egypt then it lived for a long time in greece and the sun conquered greece then in italy and then in france nowadays all thought is driven back as far as norway and russia places where the sun never goes the sun is jealous of art to adore the sun ah that was for him to adore life wilde's lyrical adoration was fast becoming a frenzied madness a fatality led him on he could not and would not withdraw himself from it he seemed to devote all his zeal and all his worth to overrating his destiny and overreaching himself my special duty he used to say is to plunge madly into amusement he used to make a point of searching for pleasure as one faces an appointed duty nietzsche surprised me less on a later occasion because i had heard wilde say no not happiness certainly not happiness pleasure one must always set one's heart upon the most tragic he would walk about the streets of algiers preceded escorted and followed by an extraordinary mob of young ruffians he talked to them all regarded them all with equal delight and threw them money recklessly i hope to have thoroughly demoralized this town he told me i thought of flaubert's saying when he was asked what kind of reputation he most desired that of being a demoralizer he replied in the face of all this i was filled with astonishment admiration and alarm i knew of his shaky position the enmities he had created and the attacks which were being made upon him and i knew what dark unrest lay hidden beneath his outward pretense of pleasure on one of those last evenings in algiers wilde seemed to have made up his mind not to say a single serious word at last i became somewhat annoyed at the exaggerated wit of his paradoxes and i said to him you have got something better to talk about than this nonsense you are talking to me as if i were the public you ought rather to talk to the public as you know so well how to talk to your friends why is it your plays are not better the best that is in you you talk why do you not write it oh well he cried immediately my plays are not good i know and i don't trouble about that but if you only knew how much amusement they afford they are nearly all the results of a bet so was dorian gray i wrote that in a few days because a friend of mine declared that i could not write a novel writing bores me so then turning suddenly towards me he said would you like to know the great drama of my life it is that i have put my genius into my life i have put only my talent into my works it was only too true the best of his writing is but a poor reflection of his brilliant conversation those who have heard him talk find him disappointing to read dorian gray in its conception was a wonderful story far superior to la peau de chagrin and far more significant alas when written what a masterpiece spoiled in his most delightful tales literary influence makes itself too much felt 
however graceful they may be one notices too much literary effort affectation and delicacy of phrase conceal the beauty of the first conception of them one feels in them and one cannot help feeling in them the three periods of their generation the first idea contained in them is very beautiful simple profound and certain to make itself heard a kind of latent necessity holds the parts firmly together but from that point the gift stops the development of the parts is done in an artificial manner there is a lack of arrangement about them and when wilde elaborates his sentences and endeavours to give them their full value he does so by overloading them prodigiously with tiny conceits and quaint and trifling fancies the result is that one's emotion is held at bay and the dazzling of the surface so blinds one's eye and mind that the deep central emotion is lost he spoke of returning to london as a well-known peer was insulting him challenging him and taunting him with running away but if you go back what will happen i asked him do you know the risk you are running it is best never to know he answered my friends are extraordinary they beg me to be careful careful but can i be careful that would be a backward step i must go on as far as possible i cannot go much further something is bound to happen something else here he broke off and the next day he left for england the rest of the story is well known that something else was hard labor i have invented nothing nor altered anything in the last few sentences i have quoted wilde's words are fixed in my mind and i might almost say in my ears i do not say that wilde clearly saw the prison opening to receive him but i do assert that the great and unexpected event which astonished and upset london suddenly changing oscar wilde from accuser into accused did not cause him any surprise the newspapers which chose to see in him only a buffoon misrepresented as far as they could the position taken up for his defence even to the extent of wresting all meaning from it perhaps some day in the far future it will be seemly to lift this dreadful trial out of the mire but not yet End of chapter two Chapter Three of Oscar Wilde: A Study by Andre Gide and translated by Stuart Mason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. For the crimson flower of our life is eaten by the canker worm of truth, and no hand can gather up the fallen, withered petals of the rose of youth. As soon as he came out of prison, Oscar Wilde went back to France. At Berneval, a quiet little village near Dieppe, a certain Sebastian Melmoth took up his abode. It was he. As I had been the last of his French friends to see him, I wanted to be the first to greet him on his return to liberty, and as soon as I could find out his address, I hastened to him. I arrived about midday, without having previously announced my proposed visit m Mermot, whom T with warm cordiality invited to Dieppe fairly frequently, was not expected back till the evening. He did not return till midnight. It was as cold as winter. The weather was atrocious. The whole day I wandered about the deserted beach in low spirits and bored to death. How could Wilde have chosen Berneval to live in? I wondered. It was positively mournful night came and i went back to the hotel to engage a room the same hotel where melmoth was living indeed it was the only one in the place the hotel which was clean and pleasantly situated catered only for second-class boarders inoffensive folk enough with whom i had to dine rather poor company for melmoth i thought fortunately i had a book to read but it was a gloomy evening and at eleven o'clock i was just going to abandon my intention of waiting up for him when i heard the rumbling of carriage wheels m melmoth had arrived benumbed with cold 
He had lost his overcoat on the way. And now that he came to think of it, he remembered that a peacock's feather which his servant had brought him the previous evening was a bad omen and had clearly foretold some misfortune about to befall him. Luckily it was no worse but as he was shivering with cold the hotel was set busy to warm some whiskey for him he hardly said how do you do to me in the presence of others at least he did not wish to appear to be at all moved and my own emotion was almost immediately stilled on finding sebastian melmott so plainly like the oscar wilde of old no longer the frenzied poet of algeria but the sweet wild of the days before the crisis and i found myself taken back not two years but four or five there was the same dreamy look the same amused smile the same voice he occupied two rooms the best in the hotel and he had arranged them with great taste several books lay on the table and among them he showed me my own nourritures terrestre which had been published lately a pretty gothic virgin stood on a high pedestal in a dark corner presently we sat down near the lamp wilde drinking his grog in little sips i noticed now that the light was better that the skin of his face had become red and common-looking and his hands even more so though they still bore the same rings one to which he was especially attached had in a reversible bezel an egyptian scarabus in lapis lazuli his teeth were dreadfully decayed we began chatting and i reminded him of our last meeting in algiers and asked him if he remembered that i had almost foretold the approaching catastrophe did you not know i said almost for certain what was awaiting you in england you saw the danger and rushed headlong into it did you not here i think i cannot do better than copy out the pages on which i wrote shortly afterwards as much as i could remember of what he said oh naturally he replied of course i knew that there would be a catastrophe either that or something else i was expecting it there was but one end possible just imagine to go any further was impossible and that state of things could not last that is why there had to be some end to it you see prison has completely changed me i was relying on it for that blank is terrible he cannot understand that he cannot understand that I am not taking up the same existence again. He accuses the others of having changed me, but one must never take up the same existence again. My life is like a work of art. An artist never begins the same work twice, or else it shows that he has not succeeded. My life before prison was as successful as possible. Now all that is finished and done with. He lighted a cigarette and went on. The public is so dreadful that it knows a man only by the last thing he has done. If I were to go back to Paris now, people would see in me only the convict. I do not want to show myself again before I have written a play. Till then I must be left alone and undisturbed. And he added abruptly, Did I not do well to come here? My friends wanted me to go to the South to recruit because at first I was quite worn out, but I asked them to find me in the north of France a very small place at the seaside where I should see no one, where it was very cold, and there was hardly ever any sun. Did I not do well to come and live in Berneval? Outside the weather was frightful. Here everyone is most good to me, the curé especially. I am so fond of the little church, and would you believe it, it is called notre dame de lise now is not that charming and now i know that i can never leave berneval because only this morning the cure offered me a perpetual seat in the choir stalls and the custom-house men poor fellows are so bored here with nothing to do that i asked them if they had not anything to read and now i am giving them all the elder dumas novels so i must stay here you see and the children oh the children they adore me on the day of the queen's jubilee i gave a grand fete and a big dinner 
when i had forty children from the school all of them and the schoolmaster to celebrate it is not that absolutely charming you know that i admire the queen very much i always have her portrait with me and he showed me her portrait by nicholson pinned on the wall i got up to look at it a small bookshelf was close to it and i began glancing at the books i wanted to lead wilde on to talk to me in a more serious vein i sat down again and rather timidly asked him if he had read souvenir de la maison des morts he gave me no direct answer but began russian writers are extraordinary what makes their books so great is the pity they put into them you know how fond i used to be of madame bovary but flaubert could not admit pity into his work and that is why it has a petty and restrained character about it it is sense of pity by means of which a work gains in expanse and by which it opens up a boundless horizon do you know my dear fellow it was pity that prevented me from killing myself during the first six months i was dreadfully unhappy so utterly miserable that i wanted to kill myself but what kept me from doing so was looking at the others and seeing that they were as unhappy as i was and feeling sorry for them oh dear what a wonderful thing pity is and i never knew it he was speaking in a low voice without any excitement have you ever learned how wonderful a thing pity is for my part i thank god every night yes on my knees i thank god for having taught it to me i went into prison with a heart of stone thinking only of my own pleasure but now my heart is utterly broken pity has entered into my heart i have learned now that pity is the greatest and most beautiful thing in the world and that is why i cannot bear ill-will towards those who caused my suffering and those who condemned me no nor to any one because without them i should not have known all that blank writes me terrible letters he says he does not understand me that he does not understand that i do not wish every one ill and that every one has been horrid to me no he does not understand me he cannot understand me any more but i keep on telling him in every letter we cannot follow the same road he has his and it is beautiful i have mine his is that of alcibiades mine is now that of st francis of assisi do you know st francis of assisi a wonderful man would you like to give me a great pleasure send me the best life of st francis you can find i promised it to him he went on yes afterwards we had a charming prison governor oh quite a charming man but for the first six months i was dreadfully unhappy there was a governor of the prison a jew who was very harsh because he was entirely lacking in imagination this last expression spoken very quickly was irresistibly funny and as i laughed heartily he laughed too repeated it and then said he did not know what to imagine in order to make us suffer now you shall see what a lack of imagination he showed you must know that in prison we are allowed to go out only one hour a day then we walk in a courtyard round and round one behind the other and we are absolutely forbidden to say a word warders watch us and there are terrible punishments for any one caught talking those who are in prison for the first time are spotted at once because they do not know how to speak without moving their lips i had already been in prison six weeks and i had not spoken a word to any one not a soul one evening we were walking as usual one behind the other during the hour's exercise when suddenly behind me i heard my name called it was the prisoner who followed me and he said oscar wilde i pity you because you must suffer more than we do then i made a great effort not to be noticed i thought i was going to faint and i said without turning round no my friend we all suffer alike and from that day i no longer had a desire to kill myself we talked in that way for several days i knew his name and what he had done his name was p he was such a good fellow 
oh so good but i had not yet learned to speak without moving my lips and one evening c three three c three three was myself c three three and a four eight step out of the ranks then we stood out and the warder said you will both have to go before the governor and as pity had already entered into my heart my only fear was for him in fact i was even glad that i might suffer for his sake but the governor was quite terrible he had p in first he was going to question us separately because you must know that the punishment is not the same for the one who speaks first and for the one who answers the punishment of the one who speaks first is double that of the other as a rule the first has fifteen days solitary confinement and the second has eight days only then the governor wanted to know which of us had spoken first and naturally p good fellow that he was said it was he and afterwards when the governor had me in to question me i of course said it was i then the governor got very red because he could not understand it but p also says that it was he who began it i cannot understand it i cannot understand it think of it my dear fellow he could not understand it he became very much embarrassed and said but i have already given him fifteen days and then he added anyhow if that is the case i shall give you both fifteen days is not that extraordinary that man had not a spark of imagination wilde was vastly amused at what he was saying and laughed he was happy telling stories and of course he continued after the fifteen days we were much more anxious to speak to one another than before you do not know how sweet that is to feel that one is suffering for another gradually as we did not go in the same order each day i was able to talk to each of the others to all of them every one of them i knew each one's name and each one's history and when each one was due to be released and to each one i said when you get out of prison the first thing you must do is to go to the post office and there you will find a letter for you with some money and so in that way i still know them because i keep up my friendship with them and there is something quite delightful in them would you believe it already three of them have been to see me here is not that quite wonderful the successor of the harsh governor was a very charming man oh remarkably so and most considerate to me you cannot imagine how much good it did me in prison that salome was being played in paris just at that time in prison it had been entirely forgotten that i was a literary person but when they saw that my play was a success in paris they said to one another well but that is strange he has talent then and from that moment they let me have all the books i wanted to read i thought at first that what would please me most would be greek literature so i asked for sophocles but i could not get a relish for it then i thought of the fathers of the church but i found them equally uninteresting and finally i thought of dante oh dante i read dante every day in italian and all through but neither the purgatorio nor the paradiso seemed written for me it was his inferno above all that i read how could i help liking it cannot you guess hell we were in it hell that was prison that same evening he told me a clever story about judas and of his proposed drama on pharaoh next day he took me to a charming little house about two hundred yards from the hotel which he had rented and was beginning to furnish it was there that he wanted to write his plays his pharaoh first and then one called ahab and jezebel he pronounced it isabel which he related to me admirably the carriage which was to take me away was waiting and wilde got into it to accompany me part of the way he began talking to me again about my book and praised it though with some slight reserve i thought at last the carriage stopped he bade me good-bye and was just going to get out when he suddenly said listen my dear friend you must promise me one thing your nourriture terrestre is good 
very good but promise me you will never write a capital i again and as i seemed scarcely to understand what he meant he finished it by saying in art you see there is no first person end of chapter three chapters four and five of oscar wilde a study by andre gide and translated by stuart mason this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four ah what else had i to do but love you god's own mother was less dear to me and less dear the cerithian rising like an argent lily from the sea on returning to paris i went to give news of him to blank blank said to me but all that is quite absurd he is quite incapable of bearing the ennui i know him so well he writes to me every day i also am of opinion that he ought to finish his play first but after that he will come back here he has never done anything good in solitude he needs to be constantly drawn out of himself it is by my side that he has written all his best work besides just look at his last letter he thereupon read it to me in it wilde begged blank to let him finish his pharaoh in peace but in effect the letter implied that as soon as his play was written he would come back he would find him again and it ended with these boastful words and then i shall be once more the king of life chapter five rudderless we drift athwart a tempest and when once the storm of youth is past without lyre without lute or chorus death the silent pilot comes at last and a short time afterwards wilde went back to paris his play was not written it will never be written now society well knows what steps to take when it wants to crush a man and it has means more subtle than death wilde had suffered too grievously for the last two years and in too submissive a manner and his will had been broken for the first few months he might still have entertained illusions but he soon gave them up it was as though he had signed his abdication nothing remained in his shattered life but a mouldy ruin painful to contemplate of his former self at times he seemed to wish to show that his brain was still active humor there was but it was far-fetched forced and threadbare i met him again on two occasions only one evening on the boulevards where i was walking with g i heard my name called i turned round and saw wilde ah how changed he was if i appear again before writing my play the world will refuse to see in me anything except the felon he had once said to me he had appeared again without his play and as he found certain doors closed in his face he no longer sought admission anywhere he prowled friends at different times tried to save him they did all they could think of and were for taking him to italy but he eluded their efforts and began to drift back among those who had remained faithful for the longest time some had often told me that wilde was no longer to be seen and i was somewhat uneasy i admit at seeing him again and what is more in a place where so many people might pass wilde was sitting at a table outside a cafe he ordered two cocktails for g and myself i was going to sit opposite to him in such a way as to turn my back to the passers-by but wilde noticing this movement which he took as an impulse of absurd shame he was not entirely mistaken i must admit and said oh sit here near me pointing to a chair at his side i am so much alone just now wilde was still well dressed but his hat was not so glossy his collar was of the same shape but it was not so clean and the sleeves of his coat were slightly frayed at the edges when i used to meet verlaine in days gone by he continued with an outburst of pride i was never ashamed of being seen with him i was rich light-hearted and covered with glory but i felt that to be seen with him was an honor even when verlaine was drunk 
then fearing to bore g i think he suddenly changed his mood tried to be witty and to make jokes in the effort he became gloomy my recollections here are dreadfully sad at last my friend and i got up wilde insisted on paying for the drinks and i was about to say good-bye when he took me aside and with an air of great embarrassment said in a low voice i say i, I must tell you i am absolutely without a penny some days afterwards i saw him again and for the last time i do not want to repeat more than one word of our conversation he told me of his troubles of the impossibility of carrying out or even of beginning a piece of work sadly i reminded him of the promise he had made not to show himself in paris without having finished one book ah i began why did you leave banneval so soon when you ought to have stayed there so long i cannot say that i am angry with you but he interrupted me laid his hand on mine looked at me with his most sorrowful look and said you must not be angry with one who has been crushed oscar wilde died in a shabby little hotel in the rue des beaux-arts seven persons followed the hearse and even they did not all accompany the funeral procession to the end on the coffin were some flowers and some artificial wreaths only one of which i am told bore any inscription it was from the proprietor of the hotel and on it were these words a mon locataire to oscar wilde author of ravenna by augustus m moore no mauritius am i who singing came to challenge king apollo at a test but a love-wearied singer at the best the myrtle leaves are all that i can claim while on thy brow there burns a crown of flame upon thy shield italia's eagle crest content am i with lesbian leaves to rest guard thou thy laurels and thy mother's name i buried love within the rose i meant to deck the fillet of thy muse's hair i take this wild flower grown against her feet and kissing its half-open lips i swear frail though it be and widowed of its scent i plucked it for your sake and find it sweet moore hall september eighteen seventy eight from the irish monthly volume six number sixty five end of chapters four and five end of oscar wilde a study by andre gide